So this is a version of a, um, of a lecture that I give uh, to a couple of my classes. Uh, the, one of them is Historic Heritage of the North Shore, which, where I try to sort of complicate the narrative of, uh, of the kind of abolitionist North. Um, same thing with my Civil War class. Uh, I teach a course on the Civil War uh, almost every year, probably once every three semesters. And um, that course begins in 1787, um, really because it's my belief that the context, right, that, you know, to get to Gorman's uh, point before, right, if we're going to understand the Civil War, then we really need to understand it in its sort of full context, uh, which really sort of um, begins obviously much, much sooner. So uh, in trying to complicate this idea, again, of the slave South and the abolitionist North, um, I have this sort of fairly extensive uh, discussion of the origins of slavery as much as anything in Massachusetts. And I know that you've talked with uh, several scholars and we'll be talking about, uh, about the revolutionary moment. Um, and so I'm going to back up from there and kind of give us some context uh, for where, um, you know, where those enslaved people who were active during the revolutionary moment uh, came from and, and how that fit into the sort of colonial era in Massachusetts. Um, and so part of the reason why I wanted to do this is that I find when I teach about slavery in Massachusetts, my students come to the conversation with several misconceptions. And these aren't necessarily the students' fault. They're really not, not the students' fault at all. Um, you know, as a nation, we've done a pretty bad job talking about slavery. Uh, as a whole, and Massachusetts isn't really any different. Uh, you know, slavery ended relatively early, as we'll see in Massachusetts, and uh, in the past, you know, 200 plus years, we've done a good job um, kind of scrubbing it, right, from uh, the public narrative, from the way that we understand public sites and memorials around us, and, uh, and even for a long period, uh, we've scrubbed it out of our um, state curriculum, right, for how do we understand Massachusetts. Uh, so our students come to class uh, with several misconceptions. The first is that there were no slave, enslaved people in Massachusetts. Sorry, that uh, I should have had enslaved people there uh, in Massachusetts, right? Uh, the history of slavery in Massachusetts has been disregarded for a long time. It's been out of the public eye. Our students uh, know a lot about a sort of booming maritime economy in Massachusetts. They know a lot about the revolutionary moment. Uh, but they don't think about slavery, or they think that slavery was not important here, right? Uh, you know, slavery, uh, even if they acknowledge slavery's existence in Massachusetts, um, they think, oh, it was just, you know, something that a few people had, had enslaved, uh, enslaved people. And so we're going to complicate that today. They think that everyone in Massachusetts was an abolitionist. Um, <laughs> that's pretty pervasive and will continue, you know, we're the good guys in this story. Uh, and, and certainly uh, Massachusetts has some, uh, a vibrant history of abolitionism, but I always remind my students that it's always a pretty small percentage of people who are actually, uh, would have been counted among abolitionists. And then this is the most sort of pernicious uh, misconception that students come with, this idea that enslaved people were treated better in Massachusetts. When I ask um, my students uh, to sort of what they know about slavery, generally they'll say uh, slavery was more small scale in Massachusetts. It's, you know, uh, if it did exist and if they do recognize that it existed and that's true, but then they say, so they make a leap. So enslaved people must have been part of the family right or the uh, enslaved work wasn't that hard right because it wasn't the you know cotton plantations that they're used to hearing about um, um and so we also want to sort of complicate that notion uh as well and so first uh thing i do is sort of to get to this issue of the presence of slavery in massachusetts I like to point to two sort of related resources. And the first is uh, the 1637-1638 Voyage of the Ship uh, Desire. My friend Eric uh, Kimball, who teaches at the University of Pittsburgh, um, has made the case, right, that we really should look at the desire as just as important to understanding the history of uh, colonial Massachusetts or Massachusetts in general 
uh, as the Mayflower, right? That these are really sort of two equally uh, sort of important moments uh, in Massachusetts history. And that's because uh, the desire is the first record that we have of enslaved Africans being brought to Massachusetts. This doesn't mean that there weren't people here before, um, but this is just the first accounting we have of it. And, um, and the way that this emerges is Governor Winthrop notes in his diary uh, that Mr. Pierce in the Salem ship, that's Salem like Salem State, uh, the desire returned from the West Indies after seven, seven months, he brought some cotton and tobacco and Negroes. And that's it, right? Um, so by 1638, we have documented evidence that there are <clears throat> enslaved people of African descent in Massachusetts. Um, when I talk with my students about this, they, they haven't heard of it before. Um, they're surprised that slavery arrived in Massachusetts that early. Um, and I talk to them about, um, you know, again, sort of thinking about historical inquiry and, and context, right? This is three lines. It, it doesn't appear to tell us much, but, you know, what do they sort of notice about it? What strikes them as interesting or notable? And part of what they notice is how matter of fact it is, right? Um, Puritans, you know, liked to write, they liked to contemplate things, right? There seems to be fairly little contemplation, at least in his diary on Governor Winthrop's part, as to the arrival, arrival of, uh, of these enslaved Africans. He doesn't express any concern uh, about the impact of slavery in Massachusetts on this sort of godly plan. Um, and this tells us something about New Englanders and their approach to, to slavery in the 17th century. And so this provides an entree for us to really understand slavery as part of that Puritan moment and not as something that is, uh, my students' first instinct is to say, well, this must be something that is very much um, an anathema, right? Or, you know, a sort of tangent to that puritanical mission. Well, when we go from the desire voyage and we go from Governor Winthrop's account of it, we can, um, we can look at this as part and parcel of, of that moment. The other thing, when we think about context and who is here, that this document doesn't tell us is what's being exchanged for these uh, quote unquote Negroes, right, that, that Winthrop is bringing. And I know that Colin Calloway is going to be with, with the group uh, later on and will certainly give much more context to this. Um, but the more appropriate question to ask is who <clears throat> is being exchanged, right, uh, for the enslaved people aboard the Desire. And the, um, and the fact of the matter is that it was 15 young Pequot boys and two Pequot women, right, who are being traded in the West Indies for enslaved uh, African people. So this isn't unusual. If we haven't um, acknowledged the presence of enslaved Africans in, in Massachusetts for, uh, for several hundred years, we certainly haven't acknowledged and only are beginning to really sort of scratch the surface, right, of understanding native slavery, not only in Massachusetts, but its impact uh, across the United States um, that, that in some ways uh, continues uh, continues even into the you know late 19th to 20th century. Uh, Margaret Ellen Newell uh, reminds us that before 1700, most of the enslaved people in New England were either um, you know warriors who were captured or uh, or other tribal members right who are captured during one of the several major 17th century uh, conflicts between Native Americans and uh, and colonists. So in this case. Um, it's the 17 Pequot captives who were part of the Pequot War uh, who are being traded uh, down to the West Indies. Uh, they're just a small percentage. There were actually 250 Pequots who were um, distributed among Massachusetts and Connecticut as household servants, I think is the language that they use. Um, they were, uh, you know, contrary to popular belief, right? That's the story we often tell is colonists tried to enslave Native American people. It didn't work that well. And so uh, they transitioned to, to enslaved African people. Um, 
despite that widely held belief that Native American slavery wasn't profitable, um, Native Americans continued to be used as household, agricultural, and maritime labor throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, right? In Massachusetts, the relationship uh, changes uh, by the end of the uh, 17th century, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Native American slavery ends. So to return to our earlier question of uh, uh, whether Winthrop expresses any concern over the presence of slavery, right, in, uh, in godly uh, Massachusetts, he doesn't. And part of the reason why he doesn't is that um, there are already enslaved Native American people, right, who are in, um, in New England. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I talk with my students about is the fact that um, it takes Virginia about 50 years, right, of sort of these incremental, um, you know, piecemeal pieces of legislation to actually codify slavery and who could be enslaved. Massachusetts does it pretty quickly. Uh, Massachusetts figures this out, right, by uh, the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, 1641, right, really codifying who can be enslaved and, and under uh, under what circumstances, and really who can't be um, enslaved. There was some English common law that set precedents for enslaving criminals and non-Christians, um, but Massachusetts sort of expands on those ideas. And this is pretty easy for Massachusetts um, because they, they really draw from uh, the Bible, right, which sanctions slavery. So if many Massachusetts communities, if Puritan communities were meant to be a sort of manifestation, right, of God's word in, in action, um, then it's pretty easy actually to incorporate slavery into that, uh, that worldview. And that's not to say that there aren't certain dissenters. Um, so if we read this, right, it starts off all positive. We look at the Massachusetts body of liberties and, and think, well, this is going to be a good thing. Um, there shall never be any bond slavery. My students are always like, okay, but then nope. Uh, or captivity amongst us, unless it be lawful captives taken in just wars and such strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us. And these shall have all the liberties and Christian usages, um, which the, I can't see the end of my thing because of the way the screen is set up here. Let me see. Which the law of God established in Israel concerning such persons doth morally require. This exempts none from servitude who shall be judged thereto by authority. Right? So what we see here is, uh, is Massachusetts in 1641 de defining really who is exempt by, from slavery and therefore defining who can be enslaved. So, um, Lawful captives taken in just wars, right, is really uh, allowing for the enslavement of Native Americans. Um, and in this uh, direct case, this sort of Pequots. Um, and then such strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us was uh, language that uh, they added to the Massachusetts bodies of liberty, um, sort of granting outsider status right, to people of African descent, and thus rendering them enslavable, right? Uh, and so we can see sort of, <clears throat> we can see the, the, the lines, right, forming as to, as to how a person can be, or who can be enslaved. Uh, a 1670 law removed the word strangers um, from the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, so this allowed for the children of, uh, of enslaved Africans to be, to be sold, uh, who couldn't be outsiders because they were born in the community. Uh, in 1680, the general court passed other laws sort of restricting the movements of, uh, of people of African descent. My students are generally sort of very surprised, right, that Massachusetts is the first colony to have, uh, to have this uh, law codifying slavery, um, and my guess is that it would surprise most students. But what we need to remember, right, is, is that the Puritan community sees the master-slave or enslaver-enslaved relationship uh, as akin to sort of the God-Christian relationship, right? So it fits well within the Puritan worldview. And they um, do some work to make sure that Puritans 
uh, and enslaved people have a way to imagine uh, slavery as compatible with Christianity. None other than Cotton Mather of the Mather family fame. Uh oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, talks about uh, uh, talks about slavery and and what's called Mather's Catechism for for slaves um, is the title of it. And um, Lorenzo Johnson Green and what I have here is taken uh, word for word from so it's really a psych here from Lorenzo Johnson Green's uh, The Negro and Colonial New England, and he does a great job talking about this. Um, Cotton Mather writes several I don't, see any, I don't see any, by the way, I just want to interrupt you say, all I see on my screen is the title of the screen. Yeah, it'll the, pop up. Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't. No worries. Okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, you know, Mather writes several essays because there are several colonists, right? Colonists are concerned concerned that if they baptize their enslaved people, that that might then render them free, right? That one Christian can't uh, enslave another Christian. That's one of several concerns that, that um, Massachusetts enslavers have about, uh, about baptizing enslaved property. Um, and Mather assured Christians uh, that this belief in his words, right, quote, is all a mistake. Uh, <clears throat> what law is it that's that's the baptized slave at liberty, not the law of Christianity. So this is Mather sort of trying to uh, ensure that Puritans are doing their sort of godly work of, of Christianizing, um, right, Christianizing their enslaved property by, uh, and by um, assuring them that that wouldn't render those enslaved people free. And he cites a lot of different instances in the Bible uh, where slavery is relatively Per pervasive, and he concludes, quote, the baptized slaves are not entitled to their liberty. So um, Green reminds us, Lorenzo Johnson Green reminds us that Puritans really thought of Native Americans and African people as inferior, right, and people who had God had made to serve them. Um, and this is, of course, something that, uh, you know, will extend, right? This isn't unique to New England in evangelical churches in the South in the 19th century, right? Enslaved people will be preached the same message uh, from, from white evangelicals. So Mather later on in his uh, life uh, writes an essay where he uh, creates this uh, catechism for slaves as, as Johnson puts it. And these are Johnston words. He's writing in 1943, and so that's why he uses the term uh, Negroes. So Mather taught the Negroes that they were enslaved because they had sinned against God and that God, not their masters, had enslaved them. Right? He sort of, the uh, Mather twists the Ten Commandments to make the Ten, ten Commandments less about one's, one's relationship with God uh, and more about one's relationship to their enslaver. So service to the master was identified with service uh, to God. And in the Ten Commandments prepared by Mather for the slave, submissiveness to and respect for the master were sub, uh, substituted for the similar difference which the owners gave to God. The fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, was twisted to mean for the slave, I must show all due respect unto everyone. And if I have a master or mistress, I must be very dutiful unto them. And then uh, Green concludes, for the slave, the 10th commandment of shall not covet was interpreted as I must be patient and content with such a condition as God has ordered for me. Mather then promised the slaves that if they were faithful and honest servants, they would receive rest from their labors and as a reward, God would prepare a mansion in heaven for them. <clears throat> this is not, a, right? like I said, this is not an unusual uh, sort of sermon to give to enslaved people. Um, you know, there's a there's a, an account of Southern preachers in the 19th century who would tell enslaved people, "Oh, you know, you will certainly go to to heaven, right? And that will be the the, the reward for your labors. You'll go to heaven, and your master will go to heaven. They're not the same heaven, but don't worry, you'll be able to see your master, right? There's a window in heaven, apparently, right? So, you know, we, uh, this isn't a unique story, but the other way to understand this is in the context of Puritanism, right, where hierarchy is important. This very much fits into that sort of puritanical worldview, right? The, the high, the esteemed are meant to be esteemed and the sort of lesser are meant to be lesser. 
um, and that those two communities need one another, the lesser need to serve the esteemed to show that they are worthy of, of God's love, and the esteemed need to be charitable, right, to their inferiors as a, you know, as a way to sort of, um, you know, to, to prove their own fitness for salvation, right? So this fits into a puritanical worldview that goes, that students can um, sort of look into even more um, in Winthrop's, you know, uh, uh, model of Christian charity speech, which talks about the sort of role of hierarchy, uh, right? But one's position on earth and, and fulfilling one's position on earth and being content with one's position on earth, right, for Puritans was the way to sort of achieve salvation, at least partly. Uh, so then slavery is legal and it's religiously sanctioned in Massachusetts, right? by you know the end of the 17th and beginning of the 18th century this doesn't get to us to sort of understanding how enslaved people are treated uh charlie you were talking about the relationships or maybe it's gorman talking about the relationships between enslaved people and enslavers and the larger sort of community being so important to understanding these these moments um and this gets to my students sort of belief right, that, well, slavery must, because it was smaller scale, it must have been somewhat more uh, benevolent. And for that, I like to turn to a piece from uh, Wendy Warren's great article, The Cause of Your Grief, which came out before uh, her New England Bound um, book, right, and she includes this uh, account from John Jocelyn, an English traveler's diary of something that he encounters in Boston in 1674. Right. The 2nd of October, about nine of the clock in the morning, Mr. Maverick's Negro woman came to my chamber window and in her own country language and tune sang very loud and shrill. Going out to her, she used a great deal of respect towards me and willingly would have expressed her grief in English, but I have apprehended it by her countenance and deportment. Uh, upon with, whereupon I repaired to my host to learn of him the cause and resolved to entreat him in her behalf, for that I understood before that she had been a queen in her own country and observed a very humble, humble and dutiful garb used towards her by another Negro who was for me. Mr. Maverick was desirous to have a breed of Negroes and therefore seeing she would not yield by persuasions to company with a Negro young man he had in his house, he commanded him willed she nilled she to go to bed to her, which was no sooner done but she kicked him out again. This she took in high disdain beyond her slavery and this was the cause of her grief. Um, when we talk about using sources with students, um, this is one that I sort of read out loud with my students. Um, I don't ask them to read it because it's so very difficult to actually uh, to read. Um, and then just let them sort of sit with it for a moment. All right. And then say, well, what do we think happened here? Right. And my students, you know, come right to the conclusion that Mr. Maverick, who owned uh, this young uh, enslaved woman, um, right, forced another enslaved man to rape her. Right. Because he wanted a breed of Negroes. And this was in 16, in his words, he, uh, this was in 1674. Right. <clears throat> Wendy Warren does a great job in her, uh, in her essay of unpacking what this does and sort of doesn't tell us. And that's another conversation I have with my students. So what does it tell us? It tells us a little something about how this woman sort of presented herself to John Jocelyn. Um, it doesn't tell us um, whether the man was a willing participant in this or not. It doesn't tell us what happened later, right? And this is, in fact, all that Jocelyn writes about the incident. Incident. The, I think the next entry Warren says is something about bees. Like, oh, there's a lot of bees in New England, right? So this is just his uh, his travel diary, and this is an account that he's passing by, right? So when we think about slavery, small scale slavery as being somehow benevolent, right? We can think about uh, this account from Mr. Maverick's Negro woman, right? As he puts it, to uh, to. Uh, to interrogate that a little bit more and ask some uh, different questions, right? This is 1674, it's early. Mr. Maverick is the same Maverick that uh, Maverick Square and Maverick T-Stop, right? 
is named for in Boston. So it can also get us to sort of understanding um, some of, uh, you know, these sort of conversations about who's been, you know, who, who do we commemorate, who do we memorialize, right? And how, has, how are those stories incomplete uh, as well? This is, of course, uh, not appropriate to use with all students. Uh, certainly, we're talking about third and fifth graders, you wouldn't want to use this. Um, so I went to um, Robert de Rocher's article, Slave for Sale Advertisements in Massachusetts, that appeared in William and Mary Quarterly, just for these little snippets, right? Uh, you know, de Rocher, this is his words, during the 1740s alone, uh, 18 owners offered slave children to be given away. One enslaver tried to give away a Negro male child about three weeks old. And the ad persists, right, for, for a couple of weeks in, in the newspaper, he's trying to give this child away. Um, this becomes a good way, right, I think, uh, a, a personal way, again, sort of understanding family and the meaning of family allows students to really sort of connect, right, with children being taken away uh, from, their, from their parents. <clears throat> But also, um, it also allows us to interrogate that, that question of small scale slavery as being benevolent in a different way, right? Because in this case, um, the fact that slavery is less profitable in Massachusetts, uh, the fact that slavery um, is most profitable when it's small, right? For most, for, for, you know, when, when it's just one or two enslaved people on a, on a farm for most Massachusetts folks, means that that sort of natural increase, natural families, right, that emerge from slavery can become a financial burden, right? Especially in times where there's an economic downturn. And so contrary to the 19th century or, or even sort of Mr. Maverick's account where a natural increase is uh, is profitable in the 18th century at different times in Massachusetts, it's not, right? And so we see very young children, those who aren't able to work yet, uh, being, um, you know, being sold away or given away uh, from their parents even. So sort of two different ways to get this at that question of, uh, of sort of benevolence. So we can see that enslaved people are subject to many of the same insecurities as those in, in you know, the 19th century South that our students are more, uh, you know, more familiar with what's going to happen to my, you know, no control over one's family and no control over one's uh, treatment. And then we also want to look at sort of um, what was work like in Massachusetts, right? What was the sort of day-to-day -day work life like? Um, in 1754, there was what was called the slave census done that uh, counted, asked every town to count and certify the number of African American people in their town. Um, and <clears throat> you can look on, in Massachusetts, you can look up your individual town and see a transcription of the census from the town. And so generally it lists just uh, how many men, women, and children, and then it's certified usually by uh, somebody whose name you'll recognize from, from the town, you know, somebody with a street name that's also named after them. If we look at the sort of 1755 census here, we can see uh, that many people in Massachusetts are clustered uh, along the coasts. Um, a third, I believe, of the enslaved population in Massachusetts was in, uh, in Boston um, alone. And you can see the sort of way the numbers work along here. Um, so we see that folks are in uh, mostly coastal areas. I talk with my students about sort of what kind of labor do we assume um, enslaved people in these coastal towns would be doing. And so thinking of household labor, you know, in the, in the uh, wealthy merchants' houses, um, but they're also loading and unloading, uh, you know, boxes and barrels off of ships. They're working as coopers and blacksmiths. Some are even working in counting houses. We'll look at that a little bit later. Um, this also becomes another way to think about um, the isolation, right, of, of slavery, the way that small scale slavery in Massachusetts in the colonial era, um, you know, my students see it as a positive, the way that it could be a real negative. Uh, if you're one of the 25 enslaved people, right, um, you know, in fairly remote parts of the state, what is your, what is your existence? like, right? Um, there's not, chances are the 25 
enslaved people, what's this kind of like hay roll uh, or so, um, are fairly removed from one another, right? On farms, you know, so thinking about there's not a community here um, for you, your whole life is really probably um, centered around the work that you're doing uh, for your enslaver with little, right, with little time for, for developing other personal sort of relationships. In Connecticut, we talk about the fact that there's a, a pretty vibrant tobacco industry in Connecticut, but um, in the Connecticut River <coughs> and its tributaries sort of running through here, um, and, uh, and wheat farming as well. Um, students are generally um, interested in Rhode Island. <laughs> And uh, to get, Charlie was talking about traces of the trade before, right? We can see the impact that the money uh, that and the presence of the, the sort of northern hub of the international slave trade has on Rhode Island, uh, where we can see um, a pretty, right, pretty vast number of enslaved people centered in a, a, in a relatively small area. Um, to go back to- Can I just stop you for a second? Yeah. Uh, before you go past that slide, um, I'm really excited about that source. It, I'd love to be able to put it into the chat. Where, where, what is the URL? How do you get to that um, to get data? I was, I looked for it last night, um, and the URL is down at the moment. But is that the guess, primary source, primary yes, research yeah. site? Yeah, and it wasn't working, but it's always worked in the past. So I was okay. going to look for another way to access it because I was going to pull up a couple of um, of different census documents. Um, you know, and include them so folks could see what they would look like. But is Wait. Googling 1755 slave census, Massachusetts usually does it. Yeah, I, I, I got there and I, and I found that that, I, I think there's something quirky with that site anyway, because I've been there recently for a number of other reasons. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll, if we can figure it out, we'll, we'll, we'll post it somewhere. Yeah. Thank you, sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, 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 please feel free to interrupt with questions or <clears throat> comments or anything. Um, the 1755 uh, census gets us to understanding where, and then thinking about uh, what people are doing. And this is pulled from uh, that New England Quarterly Rocho, uh, de Rocher um, piece. I give my students just a good amount of time to look at this. You know, the, this is the references for specific work, right, that are included in uh, slave for sale advertisements in, slave, um, in Massachusetts between 1744 and 1781, right? So uh, this isn't the total number of enslaved people in Massachusetts and what they're doing, and it's not even the total number of enslaved people who were offered for sale in Massachusetts, right? Uh, slave for sale advertisements wouldn't uh, include those people who were sold privately. But it does give us a sense of what labor was like in Massachusetts. We can see the vast majority of enslaved people are um, noted as, as fit for town or country. Um, you know, you're, you're obviously folks are advertising their enslaved people as able to do just about anything, right? Fit for town or country, indoor or outdoor. Um, work, but we also see uh, a vast number of household service um, and, uh, and trades as well, right? Um, I use this document to talk with my students about the sort of diversity of, uh, of enslaved work in Massachusetts during this time period. We think about why uh, an enslaved person might have been, you know, a chocolate maker um, you know, we, and we talk about the sort of that maritime industry and the potential, right, these sort of large, large cities. We talk about the fact that uh, agricultural work is largely seasonal. So you see a lot of people who are, uh, who are sort of rented out during the winter months um, to a tradesperson, whether it's a, a um, shipbuilder, right, or a, a baker or whomever it might be uh, for the winter months. So we talk about sort of by necessity, enslaved people are generally skilled beyond uh, just sort of agricultural labor because you not a big growing season in Massachusetts uh, as, as we know. Um, I think that this is an interesting document. You know, the fact that there's an enslaved gunsmith, right? Um, you know, there's a, an enslaved uh, count, oops, accountant, you know, there's all these different things that folks would not think of. Um, 
All right. And then last, um, you know, as my students think about <clears throat> whether uh, whether slavery mattered in the, in Massachusetts, right? Was this actually something that was important? I always turn to Joanne Mellish's disowning slavery, um, which I've lent out to several students in the past. And like, you have to get that back to me. It's one of those books with right post-it notes on all the edges for me. Um, you know, and she reminds us that enslaved people are really important to the New England economy. They're really important to the Massachusetts economy, right? Um, and they're important as laborers in Massachusetts, firstly, right? That even a single enslaved person in a household could take a lot of the work, the subsistence work of that household, right? Just the kind of labor that it takes to stay alive, they could take that off of <clears throat> the hands of, uh, you know, the head of household and leave him free to do something else. So if an enslaved person is growing your family's food, then you are free to pursue entrepreneurial activities or become a doctor or start a paper or whatever it might be. And so Malish has mapped out, right, that 1700 to 1750, which are the years of the greatest growth of slavery in New England, also mapped to the greatest growth of the economy. Right, so we see during this time period that people are de de developing small factories, right? We see uh, skilled traders emerge, merchants, right? <clears throat> sea captains, lawyers, doctors, right? So it seems logical that these two things are related, that the availability of enslaved labor to perform the basic kind of tasks of living, right? Uh, making sure that you have food and, and household, um, you know, leaves New Englanders to pursue other interests and other careers, which then leads to this sort of very vibrant economy in New England um, in the 18th century. So slavery in Massachusetts is important, right? But the fact that slavery exists out of Massachusetts is even perhaps more important, right? The existence of slavery elsewhere in the American South and in the West Indies, right, <clears throat> contributes to the expansion and diversification of the Northern economy as well. And this, of course, will continue even after slavery as a sort of legal entity in Massachusetts is ended, right? Um, Ronald Bailey talks about this as the slavery trade, right, which is not the, the slave trade itself as we think of, right, that transatlantic trade. Um, that's part of it, right? But it's a trade in goods and items produced by or for an enslaved population. So I'm gonna zero in on Salem for a little bit here because that's where I, I teach and I like to use these sort of documents for my students. We can look at how the slavery trade works um, in this document of a voyage um, to Cuba, right? And we can see on the, um, for me, it's on my left side of the screen, right? We can see what is being brought to Cuba. And if we look at this, we see that it's fish, it's lumber, alewives, right? other fish, um, cod fish, hoops, right? Uh, staves, right? we can see that. So there's lumber products and, uh, and a lot of fish <laughs> that are being brought to, brought to Cuba and rice as well, which we can look at, we'll think about in a minute. And what's coming, what's getting loaded onto the boat in Cuba, right, is sugar, molasses, uh, coffee, right? Um, so this tells us something, right, about, when we think about reading historical documents, right, when we think about sort of context, well, what does this tell us about the importance of slavery in a place like Cuba to people in Massachusetts? Right, and it tells us that folks in the lumber industry, folks, you know, coopers and tradespeople, and particularly fishermen, right, <clears throat> and farmers, and later on, right, are benefiting, right, from the presence of slavery in Cuba. That the products that they are, you know, the commodities that they're working with are being used, right, um, in Cuba as trade goods for slave produced slave people. Um, products that say people produced in, in Cuba, right? Molasses, sugar, and coffee. And this is just one little tiny snippet of the sort of much larger trade 
you know, we were talking before about sort of including these kind of just being inclusive, right? What are the narratives that we need to talk about when we talk about American history? Everybody talks about the triangle trade at some point, which as you know, sort of is, and you can see from this, is actually multiple triangles of trade. So instead of just talking about the, you know, the industrial goods to raw materials sort of triangle between England and the colonies, I like to talk about a different triangle with my students. And we focus on what are the sort of colonial commodities that are emerging from British North America in the West Indies. So we talk about the fact that New England fish and rum are two of our uh, major commodities. Middle colonies are producing a lot of grain, right? Um, that shifts from New England to the middle colonies and the sort of uh, a little later on. Um, Chesapeake is producing tobacco, we all know that. South Carolina is rice and indigo. My students can never remember rice uh, as a right because it gets so overshadowed in the 19th century by cotton. Um, but rice and indigo being huge, right? I mean, the wealthiest planters in uh, in what would become the United States were the the uh, enslavers who grew, uh, whose enslaved people grew rice in South Carolina. Uh, and the West Indies, sugar and uh, molasses, right? I talk with my students about sort of pulling out from that document and other documents what this what this tells us right so when we start when massachusetts you know begins right the most immediately marketable commodity that massachusetts has is cod and the good cod right cod which had to be salted right so the good cod went to england where it's traded around right but in the process of drying and uh and salting cod often something happens right? Uh, maybe a couple of fillets of cod get wet in a sudden rainstorm, right? Or uh, small flakes of cod falls off of the sort of larger um, <clears throat> pieces of meat. Well, that what would have been sort of refuse cod, cod that you couldn't sell to England because maybe it was a little spoiled or it was too, uh, too small to be useful, you wouldn't waste that cod. Um, New Englanders packaged that refuse cod up and um, and sent it to the West Indies, right? Where that cod was uh, a sort of major source of food for the enslaved population of the West Indies. I talk with my students, um, and the same thing with the middle colonies and the sort of grains, right? I talk with my students about the fact that uh, sugar is so profitable, right? That you it didn't make uh, economic sense for our West Indian planters to put aside any of their land or any of their labor to growing food to feed their enslaved population. It was more profitable to buy uh, foodstuffs from uh, the northern part of the English colonies uh, in North America than it was to, to sort of grow it on one's own plantation. So we have those foodstuffs that are being sent to the West Indies where they're being traded for uh, sugar and um, and molasses, right? Of course, that sugar and molasses are uh, produ is produced by enslaved people in in those Caribbean countries. That sugar and molasses, uh, much of it comes back up to uh, places like Boston, Salem, right, Newport, <clears throat> Newburyport. You know, there's been a resurgence in the past ten years or so of sort of micro distilleries, right, along the New England coast. Um, and a lot of that is drawing on a, a historic um, connection, right, to distilling. And students who live in sort of coastal towns, if they, you look back in your town's history, chances are that there was a, a distillery there at some point. And that, those distilleries are working with the sugar and molasses, largely turning it into rum, right? And then rum becomes the um, right, the sort of exchange uh, uh, on the African slave trade, right? So uh, enslaved peoples, the price of enslaved people is quoted often in, uh, in barrels of rum. So that rum could be sent to somewhere like another slave holding area like Charleston, slave trading area, or to Newport, or it could leave from Boston or Salem or other places and go straight to Africa where it's being traded for the bodies of enslaved African people who will then be brought to the West Indies and sold to those Caribbean colonies uh, as labor to produce the sugar and the molasses and the rum. Um, 
I talk to my students about this and I say, <clears throat> look, this is this coastal trade, particularly, uh, you know, in Salem and, and Massachusetts, this is the sort of bread and butter, this trade between, right, the fisheries and the uh, farms of New England, right, and uh, the slave producing, uh, slave holding areas of Charleston, right, and their rice, and the West Indies, and their sugar and molasses. This is the way that most of those New England merchants whose names we can recall, right, are making their money. <clears throat> this is the way that Derby and Crown and Shield in, in Salem are making their money and this sort of zipping back and forth between the Caribbean and New England. <coughs> Excuse me. And if we think about how important this is, how important slavery is, right, to this particular triangle, we can think about the roles that enslaved people play on it, right? So enslaved people are the consumers of the foodstuffs that are coming from New England, the cod, right, grain. Enslaved people are the producers of the sugar and the molasses, right, that are being sent back to New England. And enslaved people are the commodities themselves coming from Africa, right? So enslaved people are playing just about every role, right, uh, facilitating this, um, this exchange between New England, the Caribbean, um, and Africa as well, right? That to me is a sort of most important triangle for understanding slavery, uh, uh, the importance of the economics of slavery elsewhere uh, in New England history. And of course, this doesn't, right, um, this triangle changes, right, when we get the expansion of cotton industry in the South, right, where we can add to this triangle, um, <clears throat> you know, if, if trade with some of the Caribbean colonies falls off, right, it picks up with trade to you know the new cotton producing American South, um, whose cotton you know is feeding the the mills and Lawrence and Lowell and Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and other places. Right. I also like to talk about these little. I know this is uh, impossible to to read. Um, when you go back and you look at old documents, the thing one thing that you become aware of is, is how precious paper was, right? Because people write uh, very small and in every, every piece of the, uh, of the parchment. But um, when we look at that coastal trade, we can also see that um, slavery and the slave trade plays, can, can be a um, somewhat invisible right, piece of that, of that industry. And often, ships that are coming from places like Salem or Beverly are engaging in um, inter-island slave trading, right, in the Caribbean colonies. And we, we don't see that, you don't see it when you're looking at sort of manifests, right, leaving uh, and coming back into Salem. The place where that emerges is on these sort of uh, small correspondences and documents that are going um, to and from uh, the, the crew of the ship and the, the ship's owners in, um, in Salem, for example. And so this is when um, Richard Derby, who uh, the patriarch of the Derby clan, Elias Heskett Derby's father, when he, he was a captain on uh, the schooner Volant, which was in 1741 going to Barbados and Montserrat and Guadeloupe and a couple other places. And what I have there, it, it's supposed to enlarge, but just a square enlarges and not the writing. So that's not very helpful. But uh, what it says on in this sort of little note ascribed in the margin is Captain Derby, buy me a Negro boy, not above 14 or 15 years old, Benjamin Goodhue. Good right. So this is a, a note from one of the investors in this uh, in the ship schooner Volant to Richard Derby to purchase him a 14 or 15 year old boy uh, on um, right, on this trip. So we can see how this sort of casual slave trading, right, emerges uh, within this sort of larger coastal trade. Um, you know, in other documents, we see people purchasing uh, enslaved folks on one West Indian island and selling them uh, in another, right, and using the profit of the, that sale of those enslaved people, right, to finance a purchase of more sugar or molasses or whatever it might be, right? This isn't gonna show up, 
um, when you look at transatlantic slave trade database or anything like that. Um, this only shows up when you look at these sort of smaller correspondences. In thinking about the revolution, uh, for Elias Haskett Derby, the slave trade came as a sort of byproduct of privateering uh, during the revolution. So um, Richard Derby is the, like I said, the patriarch of the Derby clan. Elias Haskett Derby, it's his home on uh, Derby, Derby Street in Salem and Derby Wharf. That is uh, at the center of the National Park Service um, Salem Maritime site. The first, uh, he's one of, I think, several first millionaires uh, in Massachusetts, and he's a focus of, of several PEM, uh, Peabody Essex Museum uh, exhibits. Um, here we see that, uh, well, part of how Elias Haskett Derby made his millions was by outfitting his fleet of um, fishing and uh, merchant vessels to be privateers during, uh, during the Revolutionary War. And so his privateer, the, I believe this is the Polly. Yeah, uh, oh, I don't know what, that's the name of the British ship. One of his privateers captures the British ship Polly. And on board the Polly, you can see here, were nine uh, enslaved people, right? So um, as part uh, of, um, sort of the prize, right? The, um, when po the Polly was captured, all of its contents were sold, including those nine enslaved people, right? So part of how Elias Haskett Derby makes his money, right, is he makes $10,000 nearly, right, in the sale of these nine enslaved people off the privateer Polly. Now, there's a good chance that Elias Haskett Derby had no idea that this was happening until it had actually come to pass, right? Because all of this happens uh, relatively um, remotely. Uh, and we do have evidence that Derby explicitly in later voyages uh, told his captains not to engage in the slave trade. So we know that Derby um, in general was not, um, you know, was not a huge uh, slave trader by any means. But we do see how, right, again, the sort of casualness of the sale of enslaved people, right, this time is part of um, a privateering venture. Okay. <clears throat> in total, if we look, if one pulls up the transatlantic slave trade database, and this is just a screenshot that I did a couple years ago, probably, um, for, if you look up Salem, for example, and you can look up any uh, port that you want to and see how many vessels in total uh, that we know of, right, registered for trips to Africa um, as part of, and, and bought slaves, enslaved people, right? You can see, I think it's 17, yep, 17 voyages in total out of Salem. So Sla Salem is not a huge slave trading um, port. Uh, certainly places like Newport, Rhode Island, and Boston are going to sort of uh, dwarf Salem's numbers. But if we look at the um, documents surrounding one of these uh, trade um, trips, right? We can see just sort of how important even these 18, 17 uh, slave trading voyages might have been. So I go through these with my students. I look at, there's a couple more documents that are part of this, um, this sort of group I'm gonna show you. I go through them with my students and I don't introduce them as slave trade documents, right? I just have my students sort of figure out what they are. Um, so the first is I've uh, sort of transcribed the captain's instructions. And so I tell my students, read the captain's instructions. Where is it headed, right? What products from Salem are being traded? What goods uh, is the captain instructed to buy, right? And so we can see here, Captain, uh, Robinson is being instructed to go uh, to the Gold Coast. Uh, he's bringing with him tobacco and lumber. And it says, if on your arrival you find you can procure slaves and lay in the necessary stores for them and make dispatch, we would have you do it. If you could not procure as many, we then would have you proceed further and try your market as you go down the coast. Should you be able to obliged to go to the Gold Coast, we would have you bring part of your cargo in, that the word after that is unintelligible, or all if you think it in our, uh, in our interest. 
right? On your return, we would have you stop about 20 miles to windward of Demerara, which is a Dutch colony, um, now Guiana, and go on shore, right? And consult with Mr. B, who will advise you what is to be done at your port. And if, if you can trade in Demerara, they want you to trade uh, cotton and coffee there. And then um, sell everything that you can. If you can't get it in Demerara, go to Charleston. Uh, and then come back home, right? So my students generally glean, right? These are the trade goods that that student that uh, sale merchants are taking with them, right? And they're uh, on a slave trade voyage. And then the next thing that I have them look at, right, is this account of everything that's been purchased for the voyage. And I know this is quite light, but you can see there's bread and pork here. Um, but more uh, interesting are hand irons, leg iron, irons and arms chest, uh, small irons, a blunderbuss, right? Um, deck chain, foot irons, um, a pair of hand irons, right? Powder, ball, a cartridge box, right? So we think about, um, you know, what, how did this particular voyage to Africa for the purchase of uh, purpose of buying enslaved people, how did that include, right, multiple people from Salem, right? And we talk about the fact that this would have included a blacksmith, right, who is making all of these different irons and chains, right? It would have included, um, you know, uh, people who are outfitting, as you would for any vessel, right, um, for, um, for food stuffs, right? That is the same kinds of, um, you know, coopers and caulkers and sailmakers, right, and rope tires that are involved in any kind of trade ventures would be involved in this as well, right? So we can see how, right, the, the sort of tentacles of even this little bit of, of slave trade that's coming out of Salem um, sort of, you know, reaches more widely than might be originally, um, than one might originally think. The last document in this that I didn't include um, because it, it really is not, um, not legible enough when it projects is, um, you know, you can see, I believe that they end up buying, the Brig Favor ends up buying about 50 enslaved people off the Gold Coast of Africa and they sell them in uh, Martinique. And there's an actual accounting where you can see the ages and to whom uh, they were sold in Martinique. So you can see, you know, 12 year old girls, uh, you know, seven year old boys, 20 year olds, whatever. And you can really look at and get a very sort of individual idea of people, right, who are being uh, sold on the slave trade. Right. <clears throat> but I have to give a, a sort of um, acknowledgement to my colleague that many of you uh, know, Brad Austin, who found this document. Um, just sort of scrolling through the online newspaper uh, databases that we have. And um, I use this with my students to think about what is the meaning of freedom in revolutionary Salem, right? And again, we were talking about context, you're talking about sort of understanding the entirety of a community. Um, I think this is a great resource for doing that. And it doesn't take a whole lot of, it's pretty clear, right? So um, on Tuesday, July 16th, uh, the American Gazette or Constitutional Journal, which is a Salem newspaper, published, you can see here, um, the Declaration of Independence. So the first page of the newspaper is the full text, the first couple pages are the full text of the Declaration of Independence, right? And we want to remind ourselves that every town in Massachusetts in the months leading up to independence, right, voted on whether they would support the First Continental Congress if they decided to declare independence. Um, Colleen Mayer's right, American Scripture does a great job of talking with us about that, right? So most of, right, you know, the voting population and the kind of big wigs in all of these towns in Massachusetts had thought very clearly about exactly what their liberty means for them. What are they willing to risk for their liberty? And of course, 
right? These people who are at town hall, you know, at um, meeting houses sort of considering this are not actually enslaved as much as they're using the metaphor of slavery, right? They have their liberty. They are metaphorically enslaved uh, to parliament and the king. Um, but, right, almost unanimously uh, in many towns, um, they vote, right, to support the measure, right? That they'll support Congress um, if they decide to declare independence with their lives and their fortunes. And so that's a context within which we can think about this uh, newspaper, that this was already a considered, right, fact, uh, can, you know, a question for many people, right? How much does my liberty mean to me? So on July 16th, we have the Declaration of Independence here. And then if we look on the back, we can see that Benjamin Raymond of Beverly, on uh, I think July 15th, has put up an ad for his enslaved man, Caesar, who ran away, right? And I do a lot of questioning with my students about this document, right? To kind of pull it apart, right? We imagine, right, Benjamin Raymond, and I, there are several roads named after Benjamin Raymond in Beverly and elsewhere, right? We imagine him sitting in Beverly, right? Contemplating exactly what his freedom meant to him. We imagine him maybe having conversations, right? With other members of the sort of Beverly community. And maybe Caesar is in the room for those conversations, right? Maybe Caesar is there serving, but not acknowledged, right? Not considered. And he's hearing these conversations. And just as Mr. Raymond likely decides that he will risk his life and his fortune for his liberty from uh, England, right? Caesar decides that he'll risk everything for his own liberty, right? And while Raymond is able to conceptualize right, um, his own, uh, what do I want to say, Entite, right, the fact that he is entitled to liberty, he's unable to sort of conceptualize that for Caesar, right, at least not in 1776, right? So you can think about some of these questions of, of agency, of limitations, of relationships, right, of presence, because in this newspaper, right, if we, you know, we don't have evidence to back up all of those questions in the way that we're kind of imagining this having gone, right? But they're, they're not huge leaps, right? These are, you know, within reason, if we imagine these moments, right, we can think of then the sort of hypocrisy, right, of discussions of liberty in a, in a slaveholding uh, world, right? We can think about uh, the sort of individual uh, compartmentalization for many people about understanding their own entitlement to liberty as opposed to understanding others, right? Um, our students get this. It's pretty clear to all of them. Um, you know, I think it's probably gone on into many high school uh, classrooms from Brad and I doing so much teacher training uh, with it at this point. Of course, eventually, right, Massachusetts does uh, end slavery, and they do so, you know, uh, partly because of recognition of this sort of those the hypocrisy of these discussions of liberty, right, um, and partly because slavery, especially with the disruption of the um, American Revolution, slavery just is not profitable, right, um, and so. Uh, the frameworks, the new frameworks for Massachusetts uh, had said that there was a law abolishing slavery, and, and that's, of course, uh, not how it happens, right? The Constitution of uh, Massachusetts, with its principal author, John Adams, right, um, writes that um, all people are sort of, uh, you know, born free and equal, right? That language is in the Constitution. Um, I talk with my students about the fact that the Con Massachusetts Constitution is a lawmaking document, the Declaration of Independence is not, right? And that's why uh, those words in the Massachusetts Constitution start a precedent. And just like we had imagined Caesar maybe, um, you know, uh, 
seeing the sort of import of revolutionary re rhetoric for his own freedom. Uh, so do Mumbet and Quack Walker. And I know, Charlie, you're going to talk about Mumbet in a little bit, so I won't belabor her, uh, her history, right? But um, both Mumbet and Quack Walker um, recognize that the new constitution, right, um, provides an avenue for them to argue for their freedom, right? And uh, through complicated sort of uh, sort of long court cases for both of them, they eventually sort of win their, um, their freedom through the Massachusetts uh, Supreme Court. And it's Chief Justice Cushing who at the end of the Quack Walker tri trial sort of declares, slavery is in my judgment effectively abolished as it, as it can be by the granting of rights and privileges wholly incompatible with its existence, right? So um, slavery is not, outlawed in Massachusetts as much as it's rendered sort of legally indefensible, right, by the Mumbet and Quack Walker decisions. Um, gradual emancipation laws um, are the norm for the rest of the sort of North. So Massachusetts is a little bit strange in, uh, in the way that it abolishes slavery. Generally, we see these gradual emancipation laws, and though they changed, they varied from state to state, uh, what we like, what we often see is uh, enslaved people who are, um, you know, people born before a certain date will be freed on a certain date. People born after a certain date will be freed on their 18th or their 25th birthday or whatever it might be. Um, they, gradual emancipation could be very gradual. Uh, in New Jersey, there were enslaved people who were freed by the 13th Amendment. Right, um, so 1865, um, it, they were hard to enforce, um, and there was room for a lot of uh, funny business with them. Right, uh, Connecticut passed its gradual emancipation law, I believe, in 1784, um, and you know you see a lot of tinkering with people's ages. Right, people declaring that um, that uh, enslaved people are were younger than they actually were so that they could hold on to them as, uh, as enslaved people for longer. In 1808, we also see the end of the uh, legal international slave trade at, for both England and the United States. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean the, the uh, slave trade ended entirely. Uh, it's the, what, the Clotilda that they just found, uh, which was the last international slave trade vessel just sometime in the, 18, uh, in the 18, late 1850s, I think. Um, in the United States, what we see is that the international slave trade may effectively sort of uh, end, but it's replaced by a really vibrant domestic slave trade. So the movement of about a million people from the upper south and the tobacco and grain producing regions of Virginia, Maryland, those areas uh, into the cotton producing states of the deep south. Um, you know, this is usually where it's like period end, right? That slavery, slavery ends in the north, but it's so much more complicated than that. Um, you know, what we want to see, or what we want our students to understand, that when is that when enslaved people were, um, you know, were free in the North, that that's all, right? That's all they were. There was no guarantee of any back wages, right? As a matter of fact, the way that folks who wrote gradual emancipation laws imagined this moment was not, hey, if people are free now, we might owe them for all that work they did. No, it was, wait a minute, how are the people that we're going to free going to pay us back for the support that we gave them, food and housing, right, for the past however many years, right? So, so there was never a sort of consideration, I shouldn't say never, the, the conversation largely wasn't about what was owed to free people, right? It was about what free people owed to their enslavers, right? So they're not guaranteed back wages, they're not guaranteed a place to live, Right. Um, many enslavers tried to quickly sell enslaved property to a different state, um, you know, uh, to recoup so that they could profit off of them before they were free. Most states uh, enacted black codes very quickly after the end of slavery. So uh, enslaved people who had worked in skilled trades, coopers 
blacksmiths, right, farriers, like you saw on the list, um, were quickly, uh, um, what do I want to say, eliminated, right, from those trades. If you had worked in a cooper on the docks in Salem all your life as an enslaved person, all of a sudden that industry, what, you are barred from that industry as a free person. Right. Um, and so even people who had great uh, skills and trades were not able to sort of find independent work uh, in those trades. Um, there were a lot of restrictions on black immigration, uh, towns restricted uh, or would worn out um, new migrants to town who couldn't prove that they had uh, lawful employment in town. Um, States, men, almost every state tried to pass, and many states did, uh, legislation that barred uh, new immigration from free black people to the state. Um, you know, curfews, vagrancy laws, indentures for um, uh, children, all of these became part and parcel of, of the sort of freedom that was offered uh, that, that uh, black um, free black people had in the North um, after these sort of gradual emancipation laws or, or the clock walker case in Massachusetts went into effect, right? Um, the expectations, and Joanne Mellish does a great job of talking about this, the expectations uh, were that a free population, right, of, uh, of African-American people, um, was going to be uh, a dependent on a community, right? That enslaved people were dependent on their enslavers and, uh, and now enslaved people would be dependent on the towns or the states to, to take care of them, right? So it's this idea of sort of dependence and also disruption, right? That, ens that formerly enslaved people without the control of slavery would be a disrupting presence in communities. And that's why you get the curfews and the vagrancy laws and other things. Um, Right, it's a lot of the story that will we we associate more with sort of post Reconstruction era uh, in the American uh, South. In Massachusetts, I'll go back to the Derbies to sort of conclude today. Uh, I like to talk about the case of Saba and Rose Derby, um, and so I'll back up a little bit. There's going to be a um, an interactive app coming through the Salem Maritime National Park Service that I worked on with a colleague, uh, my colleague, Lindsay Randall. And um, we did it to explore sort of um, free black life in Massachusetts, 17, I think we did 1783 to like 1812. So it's sort of first 25 years of freedom or so. And, um, and what that app does is try to sort of help people to explore, you sort of make choices as you go through the app, help people to explore sort of what were the, um, you know, what were the opportunities that came with freedom and then what were the sort of limitations and the challenges that came with freedom. And the idea for that app came from work that I had done with the National Park Service and Marianne Zajewski in Salem um, on Saba and Rose Derby. So. We know that Elias Heskett Derby owned uh, two enslaved people. We know that from a 1770s uh, tax document, but that's all it says. It doesn't give their name. And so Marianne and I set about uh, going to the Phillips Library looking for whatever evidence we could find of the Derby enslaved people. And we wanted to be able to sort of reconstruct their life within the Derby household so that they could talk about it in their tours. And we struck out, <laughs> uh, the uh, Phillips Library must have enough, you know, enough derby records to fill, you know, fill a room, but very few of those mention uh, their household enslaved people. And there's a couple reasons why that might be the case. But um, what we did find was a lot of evidence, not a lot, but we found pieces of evidence around Saba and Rose Derby. And Saba and Rose first emerge in Derby documents in 1783. So they first emerge after the Quack Walker case. So we're not sure whether they were the two enslaved people from the 1770s docu tax document or not. Um, though it seems reasonable to, to make that conclusion. Um, Saba and Rose are um, African American people and they are, remain, what the documents show us is that they remain fairly tied to Elias Haskett Derby, right, as freed people from 1783 through about 1810, right? So 
in the 1780s and 90s, uh, we see Elias Heskett Derby uh, paying for Saba and Rose to receive some schooling, right? Um, they're being educated uh, by tutors. And we can think of there's a couple of reasons why that might have been the case, right? Uh, if, the, um, if the fear is that freed, free people will be dependent, right? Derby was, uh, you know, perhaps trying to provide Saba and Rose with schooling so that they could be independent and successful, right, as free people. He could have been um, giving them schooling because it uh, would help them to become better employees for him. Um, he could have been giving them schooling so that they weren't an embarrassment, right, to him uh, becoming kind of wards of Salem um, when everybody knew that they had once been associated with his family. Um, we know that he's buying, you know, shoes and coats uh, for just sort of a Negro man and a Negro woman is what it's, um, how they're, how it's termed in the documents, but we assume that it's Saba and Rose. They remain in Derby's employ until his death in 1799, and we know that because Derby's will um, pays them back wages and also allocates uh, to each of them $250, right, as a legacy. And for a long time, the Park Service talked about that $250 as, um, right, as like sort of period end, right? He gives them, but when you actually read the will, uh, Derby doesn't give Saba and Rose $250 each. He gives his daughter, Martha, $250 for Saba and Rose to be distributed to them when and how she sees fit, right? So I talked to my students about, well, they've been employed by if we presume that they are the enslaved people in the 1770s, they remain tied even in freedom to Derby through until his death in 1799. And then are they really free of the Derbys? And the answer is no, because if they want to get their $250 each, right, they need to keep in Martha Derby's uh, good graces. Um, there is no evidence that they ever got their $250 each. Uh, they do get some back wages as part of the settlement of Derby's will, and we see that Saba tries to strike out and open a shop um, uh, on Gedney Square, Gedney Court in, uh, in Salem. That shop uh, fails within a year, and then uh, he's back, right? He and Rose are back uh, in Derby records being um, sort of supported partially as employees, one would presume. Um, for the Derbies until Rose's death in 1809. And so this is like a two-day activity that I generally do with my students, talking about all of Saba and Rose's stuff. And we think about, um, you know, what does freedom mean to Saba and Rose? And we think about sort of what are the limitations on how they might be able to enjoy, right, their freedom? Um, do they seem to have the resources to leave Salem? Um, do they have access to their wages at any given point, right? With Derby's will, I think it's 18 months of back wages that are being paid to Saba, right? Um, so there's a reason for that, right? There's not, not banks uh, where Saba could hold his wages, but it's still a very different thing if you need money to have to go to your employer and ask for your money than just having it yourself, right? It's another tie. Um, and then we talk about this uh, eulogy that appears in the newspaper in Salem um, when Rose dies, right? And it says, Rose, wife of Saba Derby, free blacks, both formerly belonging to Elias Haskett Derby. That's one of the pieces of evidence that tells us that they might have been the two enslaved people. Uh, Elias Haskett Derby, Esquire, an eminent merchant of Salem. And Elias Haskett Derby has been dead for 10 years, but you know he still gets some good play in this. Uh, the good qualities of this woman had gained her just esteem, and the funeral procession last Thursday did honor the people of color from the decent manners and appearance of all who were assembled on the occasion. The friends of humanity are delighted when they see such unequivocal proofs of the good habits and rising hopes of a once oppressed part of civil society. Right? Um, I talk about this, uh, you know, right up in the newspaper with my students, and we talk about the fact that. First and foremost, right, um, Rose and Saba are still uh, defined by their relationship with Derby, right? Both formally belonging to Elias Haskett Derby. So this is 1809. Um, 
right? We're more than 25 plus years removed from slavery, uh, from their enslavement, um, but they are still formally belonging to Elias Haskett Derby, who himself has been dead for 10 years. Um, and then we talk about the way, the fact that Rose, this is a pretty big write-up of Rose uh, for the time period, and how, you know, that tells us that she was esteemed in the community. Um, but it also tells us, um, we also sort of pull apart what is this obituary actually accomplish, right? And what this obituary is also doing is using Rose as a sort of moral uh, kind of, you know, instruction for the rest of the free Black community of Salem, right? Um, you know, the decent manners and appearance of all, right? Her good qualities had gained her just esteem, right? And we see the good habits and rising hopes of an oppressed part of society. Right, so I use Saba and Rose to really complicate this sort of narrative of slavery ends in 1783 and then boom, slavery's over. Um, slavery itself might not even be over in Massachusetts, right? Even though the 1790 slave census doesn't record enslaved people, that doesn't mean that people, you know, responded accurately to the census taker's question. Um, and, right, even if slavery itself doesn't uh, continue, right? The, the sort of limited options available to formerly enslaved people might mean that a lot of the material conditions and relationships of slavery do persist, right? So altogether, what I try to do with this, um, you know, with this sort of lesson that I do with my students is really sort of complicate our understanding of the colonial, of colonial and revolutionary Massachusetts and of the place of, right, slavery, right, and of African-American peoples and populations in general um, into, those, uh, into those societies. Slavery wasn't a tough fit in a, pure, in, right, in a religious community like the Puritans in the 17th century, right, and despite the uh, revolutionary rhetoric that helps, right, ju justify or, or lead to, uh, you know, these suits that, that allow for the freedom of enslaved people in Massachusetts, that doesn't mean, right, that, that we're an egalitarian community or that those sort of relationships of slavery uh, are all of a sudden, uh, you know, disappear. And so I hope that helps to put this moment sort of in some context for our, uh, for our students in this class as well. Bethany. Yeah. Um, that was so packed, <laughs> great information, um, great research, great ways of thinking about things. Um, you cycled, uh, from, you know, 1637 and that moment, um, uh, when the desire comes and brings slaves, do I have the name right? The desire, yep. um, you know, through, um, the laws, through individual stories, but then um, you know, keeping in mind the broad contours of slavery in um, New England, um, in Massachusetts, and in Salem in, in particular, um, you touched on some great documents. Um, in one of the documents you touched on is the center document that I've used for a number of years, and I'm so glad that you're using it and teaching it as well, and that's that um, newspaper from uh, July of 1776. Um, I actually just make a photocopy of it and hand it out to my students and say, take a look at this, see what you think, and we get going from there. Mm -hmm. uh, but then to bring it back to Massachusetts and, and see what, um, what happens with um, the Derby, um, with Rose and Saba, mm -hmm. um, really in that moment of emancipation, um, and then uh, how that plays out, the broader contours of what happens with the Quack Walker and um, Mumbet cases, and then really how the post-revolution, uh, the post-revolutionary situation for African Americans in Massachusetts is um, a kind of um, a kind of dress rehearsal for what's going to happen after the Civil War, mm -hmm. um, which I think is 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 quite insightful in light of um, the ways people are thinking about African Americans now um, in the American Revolutionary context in the in in light of abolitionism. Uh, mm -hmm. We have um, Alan Taylor's book, American Revolutions, um, and um, uh, Gerald Horn's book, um, The Counter-Revolution of 1776, which is a really interesting um, argument that um, Horn makes that really the revolution is, the American Revolution is a kind of counter-revolution against the abolitionist push that's going on in London mm -hmm. and, and England. Um, to, 
see that tide coming or that push coming um, and then have that with the context of what you've laid is just terrific. I think for any um, middle school or high school um, or uh, many college teachers, what you've done, I think is, is really great. And I hope um, if you're sharing those slides with us, we're all gonna be um, even better for it. Um, you've shared us with them just going through here and I've taken a few screenshots as you've gone through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can do this right, in, right, in, right in, uh, in front of my students and we can start unpacking it. So yeah. uh, I'm really excited by um, the context you gave us and I kept thinking, um, how fortunate your students are to have you and then um, have them turning around and coming out and working in, in classrooms um, across Massachusetts. So thank that you. was that was terrific. That was thank that you. was my way of saying thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, no, that was that was really great. Um, yeah, and I, I was wondering if um, you know we could share this presentation um, on on our on our site. So. Charlie, you don't have to screenshot. <laughs> That's right. We can, we can, we can put this into a PDF um, so that people uh, can refer to to uh, this presentation and to the sources that that are included there. And then we'll also have um, like a bibliography. Um, I noticed um, Charlie put a couple of uh, links and sources on the mm -hmm. on the chat feature, but. Um, you know, and, and feel free to, to contribute more sources, you know. Okay. Um, and, and I think, you know, as I was, go, you know, listening through this presentation, I was kind of thinking about, um, I was just thinking about, you know, the, how this presentation could be, could be um, used, uh, particularly with, let's say, elementary teachers. Mm -hmm. Because I'm always thinking about the elementary teacher students who are here, in terms of like, well, what can I use, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of uh, teaching the American Revolution and teaching about free and enslaved uh, Africans and African Americans in New England, um, and 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 actually that is kind of one of the assignments for them is to think, <laughs> how would you incorporate, you know, this knowledge that you've now just acquired. And, and thinking about the context to, um, to the history of the American Revolution and, and to the history of the institution of slavery. Um, and and, and, and that, that's probably gonna be one of the more challenging assignments, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. for elementary teachers. But I think, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, in August when we get together, we will have more of that uh, dialogue uh, among teachers and, and having them to think about how, how would they approach um, these, these materials um, and, and, and deliver it in a way or in the context that elementary students are able to capture. You know? yeah. What is it that we really want that our students to get from this? What, what can they take away from that? And I think probably the trade piece of that, right? New England and the triangle trade might be the, the most immediately translatable, right? Having students just understand who goods are for and who goods are produced by. You know, we'll give a good sense of, oh wait, you know, look, Salem's, Salem's feeding enslaved people and Salem's, you know, you know, consuming, uh, you know, the, the sugar and molasses that enslaved people have, have create, you know, have produced. Well, and, and the document you have that shows um, goods going to the West Indies and mm -hmm. then being purchased in the West Indies and brought back, although it's really, I, I know I give documents just like that to my juniors um, in, in high school, um, and they struggle, but they, they eventually do figure it out, and some kids get better at it, and they're really excited about that you could give that document or transcribe that document to you know eighth graders and they would have they would have a really interesting time understanding that and then overlay that with or add to that the story you tell about the different kinds of cod you know mm -hmm. the better cod fish and then the uh, leftover pieces that are shipped yeah. and then just introducing the concept of comparative advantage you know this great economic concept why are they not growing food in the west indies well because they can realize more more wealth with um, 
with sugar. In fact, I, I know that um, in, in the story of the diligent, which is a wonderful another slave narrative um, by Robert Harms, he tells the story of a French trader, the diligent going to the West, in, going to West Africa and then to um, Mozambique, I think. Mm. Um, and um, when he when they arrive to sell their cargo of uh, of enslaved um, Africans, um, there had been a I think an earthquake or a, or maybe a volcano. I've forgotten mm. some sort of major event, and a lot of the crop had been destroyed. And the only thing that was really available to buy in large quantity, which was co was uh, coffee, which was actually contraband. You weren't supposed to grow coffee. The French had said no growing coffee because they knew that they could realize more gain with sugar. Yeah. Anyway, the book is about uh, about the controversy uh, of that of that voyage. And again, getting into a voyage of a particular ship, having them look at um, slavevoyages.org, looking out, putting in the story, putting in the Amistad, which kids used to know, they don't anymore. Yeah. It's become, what, yeah. what's that movie? I've never heard of that. It's, it's you know, that moment has, has passed and yeah um but they might know of other other voyages or putting in Newport putting in Salem mm -hmm. putting in other places that is something that middle school kids and high school kids can do and makes it really accessible so and you've laid all that out really nicely and giving them a model both teachers and uh teachers are able to then turn around and give a model to students of how to use things like slavevoyages.org um, yeah. or use those individual stories of products going and how humans were part of that production. Mm -hmm. I just want to add in um, one piece of this, and that is that I think um, a, a lot of the way we think about the slave world now is emerging into sort of a two-part system. One is this sort of North um, or Atlantic slavery that I think Orlando Patterson characterized as being uh, both more violent, increasingly raced, um, and involving what he calls natal alienation, uh, mm -hmm. removal uh, from um, of families, breaking up of families, um, literally. Um, and that, that sort of, again, new world or Atlantic slavery that's part of mercantile capitalism, which is mm -hmm. what that trade network is all about. And then that change that happens when the revolution comes and then you get the beginnings of the market and industrial revolution, an emergence of a market capitalism and a market capitalism that involves market slavery. And I think um, here you get those stories. I, I love the book, my, one of my favorite books that's come out in the last five or six years is The Half Has Never Been Told by mm -hmm. Edward Baptist. Yeah. Uh, just a brilliant uh, story. And that together with a book, a film that kids do know, and that is 12 Years a Slave. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they, they know that film or some of them know that film. Mm -hmm. um, I actually show that film in class. Um, it's a yeah. brutal film to show, yeah. but, um, but high school kids can handle it. Definitely not middle school kids. Yeah. And I don't even think freshmen or sophomores. I do it in ju junior class. And, okay, yeah. Uh, and it needs some free teaching and, and, some, and some unpacking as you go along. Mm -hmm. You can see that chain. And now you're talking about looking at history as change. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, looking at patterns and how do you how do historians classify one event one period versus another again this Atlantic slave mercantile capitalism versus um, the uh, North American internal slavery um, all of that is uh, another way of getting at a lot of the things that you're doing really in a local way that's exciting oh thank you I do that I do a similar thing you know again to get to um, kind of misconceptions right with in my civil war class with the kind of slave south right and talking about who, who actually owned enslaved people in the south and what a third of southerners actually owned enslaved people and just uh three percent owned uh enough, you know 20 people that were required to be a plantation right so right. you know when we think about the impact of of slavery right um you know, having these sort of proper context to understand it with of, of really sort of who has the power, right? The very small amount of people that had the power, had the power to shape this sort of conversation and world at the time, uh, legally, right? Politically uh, is an important way to understand it too. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's terrific. That's great. Yeah, and, and um, I guess the other, the other point I, that I've been kind of, thinking in my head was uh, 
the the sense of um, for students and maybe for some teachers is also the sense of presentism when studying history. And mm -hmm. I think the point uh, kind of just raised when you were talking about uh, Governor Winthrop and his just, yep, got Negroes here, yeah. you know, part of, you know, the products that are uh, being, uh, that were coming in on, on, on and, and so you, you, can act, you can actually have that conversation mm -hmm. about the values of that time and the attitudes of that time and, and then the students, you know, the, the attitudes that we hold today, mm -hmm. contrast, I think is important also because it, it also helps students to realize, again, the context of, of lo what life was like back then. Yeah. And well, and there's some controversy about um, Winthrop and, and slavery as well that's interesting to get into. Um, and, and looking at this uh, questions of marking and remembering um, slavery in um, that Winthrop himself had slave holdings. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, a, there's another, yet another local angle that one could pursue. Yeah. Um, right. Winthrop as a city upon the hill, um, Winthrop and Winthrop as the slaveholder, um, writing about the slave trade coming in, but also um, that, uh, that, that he, again, um, uh, supposedly own slaves, and um, should there be a sign? Should that be added to the sign? Um, you know, uh, <laughs> and and his house is incorporated into the yeah. I'm sorry, what? His house, his original home, right, right yeah. is part of the royal house, right, in Bedford, right. You can see the outlines of, of one of Winthrop's farms. So that being one of the sort of best known, right, uh, large scale slave site. Yeah. Right, in Massachusetts. Yeah, it all exactly. comes together. <laughs> Which you know, again, we 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 just scratched the surface. We'll be actually at the at the Royal House and Slave Quarters. Yes, I'll be there with you. Oh, great. Okay, yes. good. I I had forgotten that you were. I'm delighted. Yes, <laughs> I'll be there. And uh, again, a couple. I had graduate students working with me, and and my colleague Lindsay, and we have um, several different kind of primary source activities that students can work through that are all related to to the, uh, the royals. And so one of the things that was missing from what I talked about today really was um, resistance, right? Enslaved resistance, um, which of course, you know, goes part and parcel uh, with, with slavery. But we'll talk about uh, resistance a little bit with Isaac Royal's uh, enslaved population uh, when we come together uh, at the Royal House. Yeah. Great, that's terrific. And I'm also, you know, kind of um, curious, well, yeah, curious in, in terms of the, the relationships uh, between um, enslaved Africans and loyalists and, mm -hmm. and officers, the royal governors. Um, you know, I think in the end, I think Raphael talked about, you know, um, that in reality, enslaved and, and, and free Africans and African Americans were just basically pawns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. It didn't matter which side that um, you, you know, uh, offered services to. Um, it, it seemed like it was really a, a lose-lose situation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, more than anything else. But, but again, as, as another point you were talking about, the, the sense of freedom, right? Caesar is thinking, hey, if they're going to give up, you know, everything that's dear to them, including life, for freedom, that applies to me as well. Right, right. And, and again, I think it also gets to that sort of narrow range of choices. Do I go with the British who present right. X opportunity, but Y risk? Or do I go, you know, do I try to remain loyal and hope that my loyalty to a patriot enslaver will be rewarded with, with freedom and some, you know, and what are these sort of different opportunities and, and risks that present themselves and the impossible? Yeah. Right. Um, you know, the impossible kind of decisions that people had to make, especially those, you know, and, you know, in, in the South, when we talk about the 19th century South, especially, you know, thinking about how the presence of sort of, of enslaved families, right, of, you know, and, and communities, how that, you know, we often talk about Christianity as being a sort of pacifying, right, one of the reasons why enslaved people are, are, um, 
you know, are, are preached to, right, is as a pacifying force, but really it's, it's the sort of enslaved family, right? You can't run with your children. You're never going to get anywhere. So if you have children, right, chances are that you're, um, you know, you're not making that choice. Right. There's a new movie coming out about Harriet Tubman that looks yes. like it could be a very good teaching tool, too. Yes, and, and my daughters are fascinated with it. Well, and thank goodness. Um, I, I hope it will be better than, than, um, than The Birth of a Nation um, film that came out a couple of years ago, which was such an exciting moment. That everybody was excited to finally have the Nat Turner story to be told well, and unfortunately, it was not told well. It was mm -hmm. told with a private agenda. Yeah. Um, rather than, rather than a, uh, an historical agenda, ignoring all of Nat Turner's, basically his entire connection to the Second Great Awakening as a religious preacher, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just making it about a personal vendetta. A real, yeah. real shame. Let's hope that the Harriet Tubman movie uh, is, is better. I know. Looks uh, promising. <laughs> um, and again, I, 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 mean, I think the um, 12 Years a Slave is a terrific, a terrific film. By the way, for years, I always started talking about this in part by you using film clips from the film The Patriot um, mm -hmm. in the American Revolution as a foil, yeah, of yeah. course. It's absolutely complete garbage. Nonsense. <laughs> yeah, nonsense. It's complete nonsense. And all you need to do is show about five-minute clip where the, um, uh, the person who's portraying the British um, lieutenant colonel um, comes in and he asks the slaves, uh, the enslaved folks there in South Carolina um, to join, you know, with Dun basically giving him Dunmore's proclamation. And, uh, and they say they're not slaves. Now, how many people are not slaves who are mm -hmm. African-American on a plantation? Volunteers, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, so there's those kinds of foils out there. Um, uh, and by the way, if, if you are anybody who, who gets excited about um, wanting to uh, unpack um, that Hollywood movie, David uh, Hackett Fisher has a wonderful New York Times review of it called Hubris Not History. Uh, but again, that. that's almost ancient history, that movie today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So anyway. I use uh, The Littlest Rebel to start off my Civil War class and yeah. some other things and really thinking about, well, this is, that's been the story, right? I mean, it seems absurd to us, right? But that story of, of you know, the first 15 minutes I show and it's Shirley Temple's birthday party and you have the, this very stereotypical right uh you know there's uh you know uncle billy right and you know there's a, a sambo kind of character right and there's a mammy and um think about this looks it's uncomfortable to watch at points right, right. and uh but it's it wasn't we're interrogating it in one way and it was just taken as this is how it was right for so many years this 1930s movie um, and the opulence of the of the old South, and literally the war ends the party, right? Yep. Uh, you know, Shirley Temple's birthday party is is disrupted by the calling of volunteers after the firing on Fort Sumter, right? So, um, you know, there's a couple good ones that it gets it can get you where you need to go in 15 minutes. Really having students understand the kind of memory and the dominant narratives of the Civil War and slavery as a part of the Civil War in the old South. Um, you know, in 20 minutes instead of four different lectures. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, this is the, goes to the point of what we're, what we're doing. We're getting kids to think historically about this stuff and to put it in context um, and be able to be critical when they see things yes. uh, like these movies, whether they be from the 1930s or from you know, a couple of years ago, uh, yeah. Birth of the Nation. Um, or there was there was a movie on the American Revolution that I starred Al Pacino, you know, and I mean, mm. it was just called Revolution. It was just <laughs> okay, I love Al Pacino, but I'm sorry, it just does not play. Yeah, it doesn't it's work. Really yeah. bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like Gangs uh, of New York, I find that way too. What's that? Yeah, Gangs of New York with Cameron Diaz. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you know what? The the other con the other uh, pop uh, the, uh, piece that the kids do know and see, or some of them have seen those who are junkies anyway in my class, is Turn. The, um, oh, yeah, yeah. It actually is pretty darn good. I mean, um, I didn't watch that. I started it and I never, I got off of it, yeah. It's a bit of a soap opera, yeah. you know, but if you push the soap opera part aside, they actually do a pretty darn good job of representing things. Oh, um, nice. So, and you see, you see multiple angles of it, but yeah. um, its portrayal of um, African-Americans and women is not complex. It's, it's there, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. It's soap opera. Yeah. yeah. It's soap opera. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. We're not talking about political agency in quite the same, yeah. quite the same way that um, others that others are. That's funny. All right. <laughs> And I guess the one other point that I just want to make is that, you know, um, and I guess this is part of like, you know, teaching the hard history mm -hmm. is that we don't have all the answers. Right. Uh, um, that, that sometimes our research leads to more questions. <laughs> yeah. And that's the work of history. And so, you know, I, I think also just having conversations with teachers in general, history teachers in general, oh, I don't know this topic well enough to be able to teach it you know mm -hmm. level of of uh, uh confidence and mm -hmm. and so one of the things about this course is is just to to just provide a greater glimpse in terms of this topic that, mm -hmm. that none of us have the full mm -hmm. picture of, of of what we're of what we're studying what we're talking about yeah. you know yeah. And, and, and that's okay. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things that, that I feel um, makes, you know, a history course exciting is when you get students curious mm -hmm. and, and start to make inquiries and let them investigate and do the research and, that, and then that part of our role is then to facilitate that, to help mm -hmm. students kind of find those answers to the questions that they have themselves yeah. and and that you know history is 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 about humans and and we're complicated animals you know yeah. like like you know the the going back to to my point about you know what were the framers thinking you know and and what were the founders thinking about you know liberty and freedom and mm -hmm. some of them owned slaves and and the yeah. contradiction um that we may not really know the full answer. We probably don't. Right. <laughs> Only they know, and they're not around. Yeah. Now. <laughs> so, uh, so that that I think is just just I, to me that's what makes history fascinating. So yeah, and making students and teachers comfortable with history as interpretation. Right. right. You know, with with there's multiple ways to look at an event. There's multiple lenses that we can look at an event through. Right. Um, we want to make sure that we are um, being, you know, that our sort of perspective and our interpretation is in consistent with the sources that we have, right? But we shouldn't be afraid to make, you know, to make some logical leaps, you know, to make leaps of thinking about, you know, Benjamin Raymond talking about the Declaration of Independence in front of Caesar, right? Um, you know, it's a logical leap to make and it helps us to sort of put that little advertisement in, in, you know, in a different context. And is that one interpretation of how we can look at that? Yeah, right. Um, but it's, you know, it's one that's grounded in an understanding of the history and it's one that's, uh, that's also um, gives us a sort of unique perspective into that moment. Well, that gets students thinking beyond, um, so many students think history is going to be all about facts. Mm -hmm and names and dates. Yeah. And yes, there are facts and names and dates, but the, to get into the level of interpretation, you take the story, I love your story of Raymond, and I'm gonna think more and more, more and more about that, that story. Um, and you take the story of Mom Bet, there she is out in um, Western Massachusetts, and she sees the Massachusetts Constitution, she hears people talking about them, the first words of the Massachusetts Constitution, all men are born free and equal, um, written supposedly by John Adams, largely by John Adams, and in, in Catherine, um, Theodore Sedgwick, just out of Litchfield Law School, yeah. really thinking about those words differently. I, I, you know, that's, again, take those two stories, and students can now think about that. I asked the students the question, just a simple question. Um, how do different groups of people define, understand, and use the concepts of liberty and independence differently during the revolutionary era? And if you give them your story of Raymond, you give them the story of um, the two Derby, uh, um, two people who were enslaved by the Derbies, mm -hmm. you give them that Declaration of Independence in the Salem, in the Salem newspaper mm -hmm. with the slave ads, you give them um, Abigail Adams, Remember the Ladies yeah. um, letter. So you, so you have a, a different voice in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, can, you could then um, 
look at um, Dunmore's proclamation, mm -hmm. um, uh, where Dun Lord Dunmore, uh, John Murray, uh, frees um, African Americans in Virginia who will come and help out the help out the the loyalist cause. You give him the Vermont Constitution of 1777, which frees you know um, the few African Americans who are in Vermont. But there are for the few right. that there are, it's a significant moment. Um, and uh, or, or then you give them um, uh, you know so many so many other ind individual stories, and then have them write mm. these things. And what what can you make of these things? There's a there's a lesson. We, and I think when we get together at um, at uh, the um, uh, slave quarters at the um, what's, what's the name of the house? I'm sorry. Royal house. At the Royal House. Sorry. Um, at the Royal House, um, we'll we'll start off and and um, you'll be giving some lessons. I want to frame a little bit more about about how to teach this stuff together. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Great. Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. You were great, Bethany. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. See you <laughs> and, and, and hear your, uh, the fruits of your labor. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, at the Royal House. That'd be yeah. great. Okay. Look forward to it. Bye. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.